Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I've not worked recently in the area of Quantum Hall and Ed States there, so um, I thought I'd give this talk, which we have done recently, um, and thought it may be interesting for you. Um, so this talk is about uh, what is called a higher order topological insulator, okay? and um, what they are and how we can produce multiple corner states by driving some parameter in the Hamiltonian of such systems periodically in time. Okay. So the outline is as follows. So the first part is just a brief introduction for the students. Uh, introduction to topology, topological systems. Uh, then I'll tell you about a particular model of a second order topological insulator. So this is really about our work. I'm not trying to review this whole subject. Um, so I'll just tell you about a very specific model that we have studied. Um, then I'll say a few things about topological invariants that you can use to study models like this, in particular the churn number and something we call the diagonal winding number, and it'll, you'll see why it's called diagonal winding number. Uh, now some papers in this literature uh, call it the mirror winding number, but I, we, we've called it the diagonal winding number because the word mirror doesn't really apply to all the models that we have studied, uh, and you'll see why diagonal is appropriate. Um, then I'll tell you about uh, an isotropic model, um, and then how you can generate uh, multiple corner states. So at each corner on a square, you can generate more than one state by periodic driving. Okay, turns out if you don't drive it, you only get one corner state, but if you drive it, you can uh, get more. And then um, uh, something interesting, which is that you find that there are topological phase transitions in this model, and you can actually pinpoint the momenta which corresponds which produce those phase transitions, okay? Um, so I'll tell you about that at the end. And so the entire talk is based on this paper um, written with Ranjani Sheshadri, who was a PhD student in ISC. She's now um, in McGill University. Uh, Anirban Datta, who is a postdoc in ISC, and me, okay? And we're currently fighting it out with the referees of PRB, okay? So what is topology? Um, so it's a branch of mathematics where we study s certain properties which remain the same if you make certain small changes in the system. And I'll give you an example right away. And if you can define an integer which remains the same under these small changes, we call it a topological invariant. Okay? So the simplest example is the following. So suppose you have a plane and you consider a closed curve, a loop in the plane, and there is a particular point in the plane, let's call it the origin, then there are a number of times the closed curve winds around the origin in, let's say, the anti-clockwise direction. It's called the winding number, and that's a topological invariant. Okay, so here's an example. So this curve winds around um, the origin once, anti-clockwise, so it has winding number of one. This goes clockwise, winding number minus one. This is winding number one. And you can see that after a while, it can get pretty hard to just make out by looking at the curve what the winding number is. So there's a mathematical formula for figuring out the winding number given the curve, uh, which I won't, I won't tell you that formula right here. I probably will tell you later. Okay, now it's clear that this winding number cannot change unless the curve passes through the origin. So if you deform the curve a little bit, making sure that it doesn't go through the origin, the winding number doesn't change. So that's, so it's a topological invariant in that sense. Um, so since the topological invariant is an integer, so this was pointed out yesterday as well. It cannot change slowly if you make some small changes, right? If it's an integer, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Uh, it cannot be 1.1. 1 .1. Um, so that's why it's an invariant under small changes. The only way for a topological invariant to change is if it becomes ill-defined at some point. Okay, so for instance, here is a curve which has winding number plus one around this origin. And then you move this curve then at some point when the curve goes to the origin, suddenly the winding number is not defined. And then you move the curve a little bit more, the winding number has become zero. So it's well defined everywhere except at the point where it's passing through the origin. Okay. Um, now in condensed matter systems, topological sys you call something a topological if it has the following properties typically. So the bulk of the system is gapped. Uh, so there's a finite energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state. Uh, so it's an in insulator at low temperatures. Temperatures far below the gap. Um, the bulk band structure should be characterized by some topological invariant, which is a non-zero integer, as I said. 
there are gapless states at the boundaries of the system and they contribute to the electronic transport. Okay. Um, and then very importantly, there is this correspondence between the bulk structure and the boundary structure. So the, it's called the bulk boundary correspondence. The number of boundary states with a given momentum or other quantum number is equal to the topological invariant, which means that it doesn't change if you change the parameters in the Hamilton a little bit or if you put in a certain small amount of disorder which satisfies some symmetries. Okay, so here are some uh, well-known review articles on this subject. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yes. That's true. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so what you're saying is that, uh, yeah, you can have extra states at the boundaries which in the presence of a perturbation would gap each other out. And so the uh, minimum number that you have which survive under uh, some perturbations is, is what you would call the, uh, the number which corresponds to the bulk topological invariant. Okay, now the usual topological insulators that we are used to are now called first order, okay? So, the D, uh, so if, if you take a topological insulator in D dimensions, um, uh, the standard first order topological insulators would have the bulk stage gap and the boundaries which would be D minus one dimensional would have gapless states. Okay, so this has now been generalized to the idea of higher order topological insulators. So for instance, the second order topological insulator has a D dimensional bulk and a D minus one dimensional boundary which, are, which both have gapped states. But the D minus two dimensional kind of boundary of the boundary has gapless states. So for example, if you have a second order two dimensional topological insulator, uh, what that would mean is that the bulk, which is two-dimensional, the edge states which are one-dimensional are gapped, but the gapless corner states, okay? So here's a picture of a corner state. This is actually from a paper. Um, similarly, you can have a second-order three-dimensional topological insulator where the three-dimensional bulk and all the surfaces are gapped, but the edges, the hinges, have gapless states. And it's actually believed that there's a system like that, uh, tin telluride, S and T, is an example of a second order three dimensional topological insulator which has gapless hinge states. Okay. okay, so now let me jump straight into a, what we have done. So we have looked at a model for a second order topological insulator. Uh, so our model is actually inspired by something that was written down in three dimensions in this paper. This is also the paper that tells you about tin telluride and why they think it's a second order topological insulator. Um, so the model is as follows, it has four bands, spin and orbital degrees of freedom, and there is, it looks very much like the uh, BHZ model, the bernevig hughes zhang model. So there's a um, term proportional to the orbital uh, degree of freedom tau z, um, so m plus t naught cos kx plus cos ky. Then there's a part which is proportional to this, um, which depends on tau x and the spin degrees of freedom sigma x sigma y. And so just these two, the first two lines would describe the BHZ model. So the new thing that we have added, which is basically analogous to something that Schindler et al. did in three dimensions, is that we added a term like this, cos kx minus cos ky, and it's in a direction which anti-commutes with the first three operators. So all these four operators, right, tau z, tau x, sigma x, tau x, sigma y, tau y, they all anti-commute with each other. And all of them square to the unit identity matrix. Okay, so, um, so T0 is some spin independent but orbital dependent hopping, so this proportional to tau z. Delta 1 um, de denotes some kind of spin orbit coupling and delta 2 um, is an extra term that we have added and it turns out delta 2 is a term that uh, gives rise to corner states. So if you don't have delta 2, you just have the first two lines, then you get, it's a usual topological insulator with gapless edge states. But then when you turn on delta 2, it turns out the edge states get gapped out, but they leave behind states at the corners of a square lattice, for example. Okay, so a word about the symmetries of the model. So, um, um, so if you don't have delta two, then just the first two lines, then this is symmetric under rotations. So imagine you have a square lattice. So this is symmetric under rotations by pi by two, and also time reversal. Okay. The last term uh, clearly breaks uh, rotation by pi by two because cos kx, cos ky have opposite signs. So if you rotate by pi by two, k 
kx and ky get interchanged. So the last term breaks C4. It also breaks uh, time reversal. So under time reversal, you know, you have to do complex conjugation and multiply by sigma y. So uh, this breaks time reversal. But it turns out that this term um, maintains the product of C4 times time reversal. So that the combined um, uh, operator is a symmetry, continues to be symmetry. Uh, now the spectrum of this can be easily found out and it's given by plus or minus the squares of these four quantities. And that's because, you know, these are like four anti-commuting matrices. They're like the Dirac gamma matrices, four anti-commuting matrices and each of them squared to the identity. Uh, so this is the en exact energy spectrum and each energy level has a double degeneracy. And that's clear because, you know, there are, this is really a four component wave function and you have only two energy levels. So you have to have a double degeneracy. Okay, now one of the topological invariants that you can use to characterize this system is the churn number. Um, so churn number is kind of a generalization of the winding number. So the winding number tells you how many times a curve wrap goes around, winds around a point. Churn number tells you how many times a sphere wraps around another sphere, okay? Um, so it turns out that for that parameter delta two being equal to zero, the two degenerate bands Right? So as I said, both positive and negative energy bands have double degeneracies. So those bands can be distinguished from each other by eigenvalues of tau z sigma z. So let me just go back a little bit. So if this last term is not there, you can see that tau z sigma z commutes with this Hamiltonian. And so that you can use that to characterize, to label all the states. Whereas if this term, last term is present, tau z sigma z is no longer a symmetry of the system. Okay. Uh, so if delta 2 is 0, you can use tau z sigma z to uh, label the bands, and then each such band, tau z sigma z is equal to plus 1 or minus 1, you can use the wave function to calculate the churn number, and here's the formula for the churn number, okay? Um, so it's an integral over the full Brillouin zone, imaginary part of something. Uh, this, you can relate this to the Berry curvature, and then uh, the curl of the Berry curvature is the churn number, okay? So uh, for certain parameter values, um, delta 2 is 0, that's very important. You find that the churn number varies with m as follows, okay? So um, the churn number is 0 for m less than minus 2 or greater than plus 2. So those are non-topological phases. And then it's non-zero between minus 2 and plus 2. Uh, so in general, it's minus 2 t naught plus 2 t naught, okay? So in between minus 2 and plus 2, it's uh, plus 1 here, and then it jumps by 2 and becomes minus 1. Okay, so these regions A and B are the topological phases in this system. Sorry, yeah. Yes, it's a standard one, first order topological insulator. For yes, this system is characterized by churn number. It's a two-dimensional system, so it's very, you know, lots of two-dimensional systems are characterized by churn numbers. So, yeah. So, yeah, I should have said that. So the, these uh, lines, I'm, these churn numbers are, are, I'm showing are for negative energy bands with tau z sigma z equal to, uh, yeah, plus or minus one. So plus one is the blue line and the minus one is the orange line. You can see they're opposite of each other. Um, okay, so I'm not, I didn't quite follow your question then. I, I thought 2t uh, the quantum spin all is for example. Right. It's characterized by a non-trivial C2 indicator. some other additional C2 indicator. Yes. Yes. Okay, so as I said, um, so uh, the A and B are the topological phases, and there you have gapless edge states. Uh, and when you have gapless edge states, they exist on all the edges of a square, okay? Um, and um, outside this region, you have non-topological phases, and there are no edge states. Now the jumps in the churn number occur when the band gaps close. So you have this positive energy band and a negative energy band. And typically when you have a topological phase transition, the gap between those two close, closes. And that happens at certain momenta, okay? So, um, so for instance, you can see that the gaps will close at the momentum zero, zero and pi, pi. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, if you look at this expression, it's clear that, you know, if at zero, momentum equal to zero, zero, the gap will close if m plus twice t naught is zero, so m is equal to minus two t naught. Uh, and if you are at pi pi, then the gap will close when m is equal to plus two t naught, okay? So that's a simple explanation of why these are the phase transition lines. Also at zero pi and pi zero, the um, 
the critical point for m is m equal to 0, and that you can see from here. Um, 0 pi or pi 0, these two cancel. So m equal to 0 is the critical point. Uh, at all these four points, uh, this term is 0, right? Sine k, sine k, y. Now, an interesting thing is that um, at 0, 0, um, that's just one value of the momentum. So when you have gap closure there, the churn number just jumps by 1. And similarly at pi pi. Whereas at m equal to 0, you're simultaneously getting gap closures at two momentum points. So the churn number jumps by 2 there. Okay, So it jumps from plus 1 to minus 1, or vice versa. Okay, So you can actually um, correlate the, the amount of jump or amount of change of the churn number to the number of momentum points at which the gap is closing. Okay, now, um, so I'll keep repeating this Hamilton in just to remind ourselves what it looks like. It turns out that for delta 2 is not equal to 0, then this thing is no longer a good corner number, and you can no longer distinguish between the two degenerate bands. And it turns out you can't calculate the churn number in that case. Okay, okay so the churn number is only calculable when this parameter is 0. Now, it turns out that there's another winding number, or there's another topological invariant which we call a diagonal winding number which can be calculated for all values of delta 2. And so here it is. So this is the Hamiltonian. Um, now, in general, as I said, this is the sum of four anti-commuting matrices. So it's not possible to define a winding number in general. Because to define a winding number, it has to be a winding number in a plane. So you need something with only two parameters, which will vary as a function of some momentum. So if you have four different parameters, it will be a curve in four-dimensional space. and Typically, you cannot define a winding number for that. However, uh, if you look at this Hamiltonian, then you see that on the diagonals, either kx equal to plus ky or kx equal to minus ky, the Hamiltonian simplifies a lot. Uh, so first of all, the last term vanishes, and it's independent of delta 2. So the last term just goes away. Um, the first term here, so it's, it becomes just twice cos kx. And this term here is the sum of two matrices, but sine kx is the same as sine ky, plus or minus, depending on which diagonal you're on. So you can combine these two matrices. So on these diagonals, the Hamiltonian effectively becomes a sum of just two anti-commuting matrices. And so you can say that these two coefficients will define the coordinates of a point in a two-dimensional plane. Okay, so we now have a winding number of a closed curve in a plane whose points have these coordinates. And this case goes from minus pi to pi. So you're basically going along the diagonal from minus pi, minus pi to plus pi, plus pi. Okay. So for t, so again for certain parameters, the same parameters for which I showed you the churn number before, the winding number varies with m as follows. Okay. Now it looks quite similar to the variation of the churn number, except that it's you know it just goes from zero to one and then comes back to zero. It doesn't go to the other side. But if you just see where is the diagonal winding number zero and non-zero, those regions are exactly the same as where the churn number is zero or non-zero. Okay. Um, so now the corner state. So it turns out that when delta two is not zero, the churn number cannot be calculated as, as, as I said, but the winding number remains the same. In fact, the winding number is completely independent of the value of delta two. Uh, now, in this region, minus 2 to plus 2, where the winding number is one, equal to 1, you find that uh, there's a gap of order delta 2 which opens in the spectrum of the edge states, and a gapless state appears at each corner of a square lattice. Okay, so here's a picture of the full energy spectrum, just to show you all the different kinds of states that there are. Okay, so these uh, black lines, continuous black lines, are the bulk states. Then these red lines are the edge states, and you can see that they've got a small gap in the middle, and that's because we have a small delta 2, which is 0.1. And right in the middle, you can see a point, and that's actually four points. So there are four states, and those correspond to states at the four corners of the square lattice. Okay, so this picture actually shows you bulk, edge, and corner states, everything. Um, so 25 by 25 sites, and remember, it's a four-band model, so 2,500 states. And here's a picture of a corner state. Um, the four corners, one, two, three, four. Uh, so I'm showing you one particular corner state. There's a similar one at every corner. An interesting thing about this corner state, so there's a probability, mod size squared. Uh, interesting thing is that it decays very quickly into the bulk. So along the diagonal, as you go into the bulk, right, 
Uh, it decays very quickly, but along the edge, it doesn't decay so quickly. Okay? So it has kind of two different decay lengths. And the reason is that um, the decay length along the edge is actually proportional to delta 2, which is the one that gaps out the edge states. So the decay length is along the edge is proportional to 1 by delta 2. Okay? So, and delta 2 is very small, 0.1. So the decay length along the edge is quite large. The decay length in the bulk is governed by the other parameters, delta 1, T0. So those are of order 1. Okay? Okay, so it's kind of, the decay is quite anisotropic. Okay, so here's a rough uh, explanation um, for why you have corner states. So here are the edges of the system. Now for delta 2 equal to 0, as you know, uh, this is the usual BHZ model. So the edge states satisfy massless Dirac equations on each of the edges. Now this delta 2 term acts as a mass term, and so it gaps out the edge states. But if you look at it closely, you see that, you know, it has opposite signs on the x edges and the y edges. So when you go from one edge to the next, this is a mass term which is changing signs. So imagine you're going around like that, and you go around the corner from this edge to this edge. You have a mass term which changes sign. And it's well, well known that if you have a Dirac equation one dimension and you have a mass term which changes sign somewhere, then you'll get a, a zero energy mode bound around that point. Okay? So that's basically the reason why you have corner states in this model. Um, by the way, I mean, students should feel, uh, anyone should feel free to ask questions at any point. I'm going to finish well before time, so, you know. <laughs> um, now, you know, the, as I said earlier, the, the model that I dis discussed earlier has a winding number and churn numbers being zero and non-zero at more or less the same, at exactly the same regions. So just for variety, we decided to look at another model. Um, this, I think, has not been discussed before, but we looked at another model which is anisotropic. Not completely anisotropic, but partially anisotropic, as I'll explain. So what we have done in this model is that earlier you had this hopping T0, which had the same value for cos Kx and cos Ky. So let's just allow them to be different and see what happens. Um, sorry? Yeah, this changes sign. So it's just that cos Kx, it's, they have opposite signs, cos Kx and cos Ky. Yes. Right, so there's a recent uh, paper on the archive where people have studied um, a graphene-like model, and um, they have shown, which is on a hexagonal lattice, a big hexagonal lattice. And they have shown that you can get corner states there at all the six corners. Or does it have to be corner? Yeah, for example, it doesn't have to be corner. I guess if it changes sign anywhere, you can get a state appearing there. It doesn't actually have to be corner. But yeah, but what I wanted to say, it doesn't have to be a square. It can be any uh, any shape. Now, um, I think the following is true, though. Uh, so we have tried looking at triangles, and you don't get corner states there. So somehow it seems to be important to have an even number of corners. Um, and it doesn't have too much to do with the lattice. It more, um, has to. Right. 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 I see. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be a lattice, though as Adib will tell you in the afternoon. <laughs> you get, not 90 degrees. OK. Dispersing more, you mean, uh, so it's not just a single state anymore? OK. Oh, I see. I see, OK. Okay, I see. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, when you don't have delta 2, you have these two degenerate bands, and they have equal and opposite turn numbers, say plus 1 and minus 1. Now, when you do have delta 2, these bands get mixed up. 
And so you discover that, you know, you try to calculate churn number and um, so the bands are still there, but they, since they're mixed up, um, it's not clear. So suppose you're trying to find the churn number numerically, right? You calculate the Berry curvature and then you calculate the churn number from there. So this, basically the numerical program gets completely confused because it, sometimes it picks one linear combination, sometimes picks a different linear combination, depending on where you are in the Brillouin zone. And you find that, you know, it just, it, the Berry curve which actually makes no sense. It just jumps all over the place. Not in this model, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, okay so, uh, so we allow these two couplings to be different. However, we did not take these two couplings to be different. Okay, and that's in order to maintain the diagonal winding number. But you see, once these two couplings are different, then you don't have this mirror symmetry anymore. So the mirror symmetry is the symmetry of reflections about the diagonal. And that disappears as soon as you make these two different. And that's why we decided not to call this the mirror winding number, but we call it the diagonal winding number, which is still true. So the, that's still defined along the diagonal in the Brillouin zone. Um, so you can also have different coefficients for these two terms, but that doesn't matter, it turns out. I, that, that has no effect on the churn number or winding number. So now you discover that the churn and diagonal winding numbers look quite different from each other. Okay, so here's a churn number, so it's zero, then it becomes plus one, then comes down to zero, then it becomes minus one and so on. Whereas the winding number is just zero or one. Okay, so you have this interesting region in the middle, region two, where the churn number is zero, but the winding number is not zero. Okay, and so what is this, what does the system look like on this, um, in this intermediate region? So actually quite, Quite interesting. So it turns out that in this region, the churn number is zero. So it's basically not a strong topological insulator, but it's what is called a weak topological insulator. And uh, so for example, when Tx is less than Ty, you find that you get edge states only on the edges parallel to the x direction, and no edge states in the edges parallel to the y direction. So it's not a strong topological insulator because a strong Ti would have states on all the edges. So this is this has um, edge states on only some of the edges. So it's what is it's an example of what's called a weak topological insulator. Uh, when you turn on delta two, then you get corner states in all the three regions. Okay, so the winding number uh, faithfully tells you where you'll get corner states. Okay, whereas the uh, churn number sort of um, becomes kind of problematic uh, in this model. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about what we did with periodic driving. So we took, uh, so you can actually drive many different parameters. The simplest thing that we thought of driving is this M. So which is like the, you know, it's the orbital um, parameter, right? It has different values for the uh, two orbitals, plus one and minus one. So we studied what happens when you drive this M periodically in time. And we're going to drive it as a sequence of two pulses, right? So it basically will look like um, so here's M as, as a function of time. And so we're just going to have two pulses. So one is M1 and the other is M2, okay? Now you can have it as follows, from zero to one time period, it could be M1 first and then M2. But we decided to do it slightly different, which is actually equivalent to this. We have it as M1 for the first one-fourth of a time period, then M2 is for the next half time period, and then M1 as the last one fourth. It's really the same as this under a time shift, okay? But it turns out that this has a little more symmetry, and that helps us in certain ways. Oh, no, 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 so it turns out when you turn on delta two, you get corner states at all the four corners. Just as for the isotropic model, the corner states, when they appear, they appear in all the four corners. So when you don't have delta two, uh, so you have massless Dirac equations on two of the edges and a massive Dirac equation on the other two edges. Then when you turn on delta two, even the two massless Dirac things become gapped out, but then you get corner states at all the four corners. So basically you can, you can ignore the two edges which are gapped out anyway to start with. So just think of the other two edges, right? And then you turn on delta two and each of those edges, each end of that edge gets a corner state. 
So you get four corner states anyway. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is the driving protocol. And then you repeat this periodically in time with this time period capital T. Uh, so now, then you calculate the time evolution operator for one time period. So it's defined as the time order product of e to the minus ih dt. Um, and we, you can write it like this, where h1 and h2 correspond to the Hamiltonians with m being equal to m1 and m2. Now the reason for choosing this particular ordering rather than the simpler form where you know you just have these two for half time period is, is that to have an additional symmetry which allows us to define a diagonal winding number. And I'll show you what that additional symmetry is in the next slide. Okay, so again for delta 2 is 0 we can use tau z sigma z to distinguish between the different bands of eigenstates. So these are now Floquet eigenstates of that operator uf. And then we can calculate the churn number. And again, for delta 2 not equal to 0, you cannot calculate the general number. Now, now for the um, winding number. So you find that for any value of delta 2, the driving protocol that we have used, this half quarter, half quarter, implies that this is a symmetric matrix. Okay. Because, you know, you, you take the symmetry, uh, the transpose of this, and these two just get interchanged. And uh, you can work out what kind of symmetric matrix it is, and it is the exponential of the sum of only two anti-commuting matrices, which are both symmetric matrices. And therefore, you have this result that now the Floquet operator is the exponential of the sum of only two anti-commuting matrices. So you take the co those two coefficients as the coordinates of a point in a plane. Um, and all this happens only on the diagonals. So again, you can define a diagonal winding number for this particular driving protocol. Okay, so here's now a plot of the topological invariants. Um, the first one is a churn number. This is for delta 2 is 0. The second one is the winding number, which is independent of delta 2. Um, um, this is some uh, choice of the driving parameters. M1 is minus 0.9, M2 is minus 0.45. Uh, this is for the anisotropic model. So Tx is 1, Ty is 2. So you find that you really now have quite wild variations in these topological invariants. So C can go from 0 to 1, come back to 0, then go to 2. At some point it goes to 4 and then you know, jumps from 0 to 4 and so on. Okay? And I'll try to give an explanation for why all these things happen. The winding number also um, now can change by more than 1. It can go from 1 to 3 and then come back to 1 and so on. Now, before I go on, um, it turns out that there are some F things that you see in this picture which are not real. Like, there are some fluctuations around t equals 4.8 to 4.9. These are really numerical artifacts. In the sense that if you look at, uh, so the way we are calculating the churn number is that you look at, let's say, uh, the negative energy, the quasi-energy band which is below zero and calculate, use those wave functions to calculate the Berry curvature. But what happens is that uh, for certain values of the driving, the time period t, some of these, the positive energy bands and negative energy bands can come very close to each other at certain momenta. And when that happens, this calculation of the Berry, Berry curvature becomes very difficult because, you know, the bands are so close, the numerical program gets confused between whether a state is in the upper band or the lower band. And so the Berry curvature fluctuates all over the place, and then to get the churn number by integrating that becomes very difficult, okay? So that's really the explanation of these, this fluctuation that you see here. But this jump of 4 from 0 to 4, that's a genuine effect, and I'll give you an explanation of that later. Okay, right. Yeah, that's true, right. So, so it turns out that, I think that's true, that when you get corner states, you find that the edge states are all gapped out. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, we do get um, um, we do, do get corner states, for example, at both Floquet eigenvalue equal to plus one and minus one. Yes. Um, so, as I said, uh, here's 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 a point where uh, the diagonal winding number is three. So, just to kind of show off a little bit, let me show you the winding number for this. Um, so, this is a plot. So remember the Floquet operator is the ex exponential of the sum of two anti-commuting matrices. Let's call those coefficients a and b and plot it as a function of k from minus pi to pi. You get a curve like this. Just by looking at the curve, it takes a while to figure out that the winding number is three, but it, it is three. 
And so here, for this particular set of parameters, you do find that every corner of the square has three states. So there are a total of 12 corner states, okay? Um, so this is a different picture of the same kind of thing. These are the eigenvalues of Floquet operator. So the Floquet operator is a unitary op matrix, so the eigenvalues lie on the unit circle. And so the blue regions show you all the bulk states. And there are um, these points which lie in the gap of the bulk state. They all lie at Floquet eigenvalue equal to plus one. There are actually 12 states there which all degenerate with each other. And they correspond to three states at each corner of the square. Now, uh, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about is why do these jumps in the topological invariants occur, okay? So is there a way to figure out at what values of t you'll get these jumps? Uh, so these jumps clearly uh, stand for some kind of topological phase transitions. So they occur when the gaps between some of the, you know, some positive energy and uh, positive quasi-energy and negative quasi-energy bands, they touch each other at some momentum. Because when that happens, then um, you know you cannot calculate. Um, so that is the point where the winding number becomes ill-defined. Okay, so that they so these jumps occur when the Floquet operator becomes equal to um, plus or minus the four by four identity matrix. Remember that you know this U is a four by four matrix as a function of the momentum. Um, I probably didn't clarify this. So when you calculate winding numbers or churn numbers, you have to calculate it in momentum space. So then U is a four by four matrix. Whereas when you calculate, um, when you're trying to look for edge states or corner states, then U is the Floquet operator of a square lattice. So then it's a huge matrix. You know, 25 by 25 uh, lattice, it'll be uh, 4,000 dimensional matrices. So right now I'm talking about U in momentum space. So, um, so these jumps will occur when it's equal to plus or minus the identity matrix because that's when the uh, eigenvalues of U are degenerate. So you have this touching of the uh, different eigenvalues of U. Okay, so the question now becomes, uh, at what values of K does the Floquet operator become equal to plus or minus the identity matrix? So first thing to look at uh, is, is the special momenta, which are all time reversal invariant. So 0, 0, 0, pi, 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 0, pi, pi. It's all time reversal invariant because k and minus k are the same. Uh, so here the degeneracy condition can really be found analytically. So if you put delta to equal to zero, then the Hamiltonian has this form. And if you look at these um, four points, then uh, you discover that this h1 and h2, which correspond to m1 and m2, two different values of m, they commute. So you can write this entire thing as the exponential of a single matrix. And just you know, put in these values of k, you'll find that these are the conditions for when this thing becomes equal to e to the power i n pi, so, so that it's plus or minus the identity matrix. So just the simple condition will tell you what are the values of t where you expect jumps, uh, or these topological phase transitions, or jumps in the churn number. And this explains the location of many of the jumps that you see in the churn number. So, so many of them, most of them, in fact, are explained by these, these two formulas. Now, what is kind of unusual in this system is that you discover that there are other values of k where there are no particular symmetries, where also you can get jumps in the churn number. Uh, so, so again, since we are talking about the churn number, we have to put delta 2 equal to 0. So this is the formula. And now, generally, h1 and h2 don't commute with each other, right, for arbitrary values of kx, ky. So the only way this will be equal to I, I, the identity matrix is if these two factors separately are equal to the identity matrix. So that means that this um, K has to satisfy two conditions simultaneously, which correspond to this one and this one separately being equal to the identity matrix. So you get these two conditions. Okay, so the idea is that if you can find values of Kx and Ky for which these are both satisfied, where N and N1 and N2 are some integers, then that will tell you uh, other points where the number can show a jump. Okay, so it turns out the simplest solution of these equations that I wrote down here is for n1 and n2 equal to 1. And then you can really simplify those equations and you get these two conditions on kx and ky. Now it turns out that because this is an equation for cos kx, kx can take two values, plus or minus. And independently, ky can take two values. So you have four possible values of kx, ky satisfying these equations. And uh, so there are four momenta points at which the uh, 
the quasi-energy band is gap is closing. And this explains the jump of four in the churn number. And you can see from here, you can work it out. You find that it tells you that you should get a jump of four at the time period 4.49, which is exactly this, this jump from zero to four. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, so we have basically, I've told you about two models, isotropic and anisotropic versions of the BHZ model. Uh, but then you add this extra term delta two, which can, uh, which turns it into a second order topological insulator with corner states. There are two topological invariants you can use to characterize these systems. There's a churn number and there's a diagonal winding number. The churn number is defined only if this parameter delta two that you in, we introduce is zero. And it gives the number of gapless eight states. The winding number gives the number of gapless corner states when delta two is not zero. Uh, for the anisotropic model, as we saw, the regions of non-zero churn number and non-zero diagonal winding number don't coincide. Um, exactly the same uh, invariants, churn and diagonal winding numbers can be used for the periodically driven system. And the winding number here can be larger than one. It just depends on the parameters of the driving, the amplitude of driving M1, M2, and the time period, and so on. And so the number of states at each corner can be more than one. And the jumps in the topological invariants, which indicate phase transitions can occur at either the time reversal invariant momenta, which is the usual story, but they can also occur at momenta which have no special symmetries. Okay, so that's basically the summary of the work, and this is the, um, the archive number. Thank you.